to bring some small measure of justice to Ms. Arano. Um, a year ago yesterday, Ms. Arano was attacked, shot in a drive-by style shooting on Highway 90. When the Walton County Sheriff's Office arrived, um, you know, Ms. Arano's fighting for her life. And to this day, she is permanently disabled as a result of that attack. She is lucky to have survived that attack. And it has been a long, arduous journey for her, and unfortunately, one that is still ongoing. She is still challenged today and will be the rest of her life. But what a tremendous spirit to have her with us here today to show that she is not afraid, she's not cowed by these individuals. Um, a reflection of her faith, a reflection of the strength of her family that she's here with us today. At the time of this attack, we knew almost immediately that Ms. Arano had absolutely no involvement in this. There was simply no evidence to indicate in any way, shape, or form she was anything other than what she was, which was the victim of mistaken identity. And as senseless as that sounds, it's the simple fact in this matter. The individuals you see before you today, I'm not gonna speak their name, I don't think they warrant it, um, were attempting to murder someone else. They were attempting to take the life of someone else. In their infinite wisdom, they shot the wrong person. How serious were they about this? At least 17 rounds struck that vehicle that Ms. Arano was in. That's the, that's the number of rounds we know for a fact were fired. Multiple shooters, multiple weapons. But because Ms. Arano had no involvement in this, we really started with uh, very little evidence to start with. And through the course of 100 plus interviews, 25 plus subpoenas, 10 plus search warrants, which are still ongoing. I'm gonna let Mr. Mitchell talk about that in just a second, about the, the facts of uh, you know, where prosecution and where the case will go. But a dedicated solid year of multiple agencies, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, the Phoenix Springs Police Department, the Sheriff's Office, the State's Attorney working closely with us at night, in the evenings, bouncing ideas off, trying to make sure that we brought these individuals to justice. And I will tell you, there had been a, a, number, of ser a number of shootings in and around the Defuniac Springs area, about 14 to 15 shootings over the previous year. That was our initial starting point for this investigation. They ended up not all being related. However, it did allow us to develop a pool of suspects uh, to, to start interviewing and start working with, and countless man hours, again, by you, you see around you, everyone in this room was involved in some level of investigating, working this particular investigation. You know, I would, I would love to name them, but quite frankly, there's too many, and I would do a disservice by not naming someone who has spent the amount of time I had. We had changes in leadership in our investigation bureau. Not once did this ever fall off our radar. We continued to have briefings. We continued to have discussions with the state. We would go. And, and I think, you know, to the importance of a successful prosecution, that's one, th that's one thing that sometimes we forget. And I know Ms. Madden and, and Mr. Mitchell and I have discussed these in the past. It's one thing to make an arrest. We need to have convictions. And I feel very confident uh, in our close working relationship, making sure that we met the evidentiary standards that uh, the state's attorney's office wanted to see in this matter, that there was a constant flow of communication over the course of a year. I know the public has asked on several occasions, you know, when are you going to make an arrest in the Rano case? When are you going to make an arrest? I think, you know, and I'm going to let Mr. Mitchell talk about this just a second, about the length of time it takes to do some of these things, everything from subpoenas to search warrants. But in the application of justice, it must be done professionally and correctly without a sense of public urgency or public relations. It must be done correctly because we owe that to Ms. Arano. We owe that to our community. We can talk a little bit about um, some of the specifics of this. One of the questions that's been asked me about is, is motive. I, you know, I quite frankly think it's irrelevant. 
I could give you a motive, but at the end of the day, it would make zero sense to you, no more than it does to me. But I want to turn it over at this point to our, our, our station chief, if you will, Mr. Josh Mitchell, to kind of tell you a bit about how prosecution will move forward, what they're looking at, and the, the kind of time frame that's involved with some of the things that we have to do, and then we'll take whatever questions you have in regard to specifics. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Good morning. I would just like to echo the sheriff's uh, statements that th this was a total team effort between the sheriff's office um, and the state attorney's office to Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Um, there were numerous subpoenas that were issued by Ms. Madden's office and those subpoenas resulted in uh, leads that were both used to track down where persons were. Additionally, uh, that led to numerous search warrants being issued by our local judges here in Walton County. Um, with regards to the subpoenas, these things take uh, a vast amount of time. Sometimes it's upwards of six months. I know we are still uh, have numerous subpoenas and search warrants outstanding waiting to get results. As far as the prosecution, um, you know, I think at this time it would be a little premature to, to dive off into any pretrial publicity issues, but I will let you know that this is a marathon and we are just beginning. Um, as Sheriff said, we, we've worked hand in hand from the beginning a year ago to this point and we will continue to work. And I know that the men and women of the Walton County Sheriff's Office are still tire tirelessly working at, th at this juncture. And so we look forward to continuing that and, and resulting in a successful prosecution for Ms. Arano and her family. Thank you. And I don't, I don't think I actually touched on this a minute ago, but I will say just specifically, there is a significant amount of evidence in this case that was uh, collated over over this past year and a lot of what had to happen in this case was the elimination of potential suspects and so when you interview as many people as this team of investigators uh, and, and one of our, our former lead investigator is now with the studio of Phoenix Springs the amount of time that they spent all of these folks involved they had to eliminate suspects, which is equally important. They had to collate these statements against each other. They had to make sure that what they said was accurate, not to be in a rush to make an arrest, but to do it thoughtfully and professionally and one that would sustain, uh, sustain a successful prosecution. But I think when you see the overwhelming volume of evidence um, that really kind of interesting in this case, that it developed somewhat independently from some of the actual uh, interviews but as these subpoenas continue to come in, I think it will further solidify our opportunity to be successful in prosecution. And with that, I will turn it over to any particular questions you may have. Chair, um, I noticed on one of the last questions that said, uh, Mr. St or the last name Stanley, if St wanted, is he still? Yeah, he is, at, he is at large right now. We'd ask anyone in the public that has any uh, idea of his whereabouts to please call the Walton County Sheriff's Office. You know, that is a 911 call for sure. Uh, this is an individual who is wanted for an attempted murder. So you, you need to take that with the level of risk. Please do not approach him. Please not attempt to make contact. Please call the Walton County Sheriff's Office. But that is absolutely a 911 call. We're confident that we're gonna be able to bring him into custody. Uh, he is local. He's from this area, as are the rest of the individuals involved. Uh, the female there, as you see there, she's currently in route to the Florida Department of Corrections on a 30-year sentence on another shooting. And as I said before, there were about 10 to 15 shootings in the surrounding area of Defuniac Springs in the year prior. And, and from that, we were able to seize a number of firearms. Whether or not the firearms are the ones used in this case, that will remain to be seen. There's a lot of time involved in testing these type of things. So you got to figure nine, 10 months on some of these testing results, at least. Yes, ma'am. What has uh, been the sheriff's office involvement with the family throughout this past year? So, you know, to the best of our ability, we've tried to make sure that Ms. Serrano is kept up to date on what's going on with the case. So, that, and, I, and I think there, you know, quite frankly, there would have to be some initial fear of, hey, it's been two months. 
You haven't done anything yet. Sometimes when we don't see an arrest, we make the assumption that nobody is working on it, which in this case is the opposite. This has been a constant contact, constantly trying to stay involved so that the Arano family knows what's happening. Obviously from our victim advocate side and some folks trying to do some community outreach to help, and we will, we'll talk about that as well too, the opportunity to continue to support this family. As you can imagine, this is a absolutely devastating at a personal level, but as a financial impact, this is a devastating to a family with ongoing financial impact the rest of their lives. And so, you know, we as a community, our, our local churches and, and people that want to help, I know that they would appreciate it. They need it desperately. They're not out here saying this. I'm saying it for them that they need, they need your help. Anyone else? Yes, sir. And how assuring is it for, for the sheriff's office here to, to be able to give Ms. Arrival at least some answers, especially um, because it is sort of that year on the mark. Talk about that kind of thing. Right? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, I think the longer you go away from the particular incident, it gets harder and harder to make an arrest in some regard. And I think that from the public standpoint, you know, you, ha you have this feeling of what is being done, what is being done. But, you know, in, in, the, in the day of instant information, right? Everything is on a 24-hour news cycle. People have information. We spend a lot of time beating back rumors. You know, we spend a lot of time having to, you know, our investigators, our staff, our, our, our all the people involved in this. Every time somebody posts some false information, we have to go run that down. You leave no stone unturned. So, you know, it cost us a lot of, if I'm being honest, it cost us a lot of problem just sorting through the rumors. But I think, you know, for dedicated professionals to take the time and to run this thing down and to never stop working, I think if there's one thing I would say as a takeaway from the investigation standpoint, just because you don't see something is not the proof of absence of effort. And in fact, in this business, it should be quite the contrary. We are not in the business of advertising every interview, every step we do. It's not appropriate for us to do that. It does not help with a successful prosecution. And quite frankly, everybody becomes a, a Facebook CSI detective and it causes problems. It causes problems. We need to do our job professionally and consistently. That's what the people expect from us. That's what they've got in this investigation. Any further questions? Do we know, yes. oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, do we know uh, uh, who or do you guys, well, do, you, do you know who was a, was a single person that, uh, uh, was responsible for shooting, or was a was it multiple people? Multiple shooters, multiple weapons, multiple shooters. I mean, again, look at the number of rounds fired as well, too. Obviously, as in, and I think Mr. Mitchell touched on this. There's still subpoenas out. There's still a lot of evidence we're going through, and we'll certainly be interested interested to see what some of the other folks have to say. Some of these folks are cooperating, cooperating and talking. I mean, we're we're very confident about where we sit on this part. But we will see in the future what other evidence is turned. If additional charges are appropriate, I'm sure feel certain the state will move forward as it is uh, appropriate. What are you looking in the way of prosecution? Do we uh, 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 will you be pursuing? Yes, not not to uh, to mislead you, but we we seek the 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 justice in every case. In this case, we will sit down. We will look at criminal histories. We will look at uh, we'll talk to the victim. And we will see what is the appropriate sentence that we would be willing to um, what we would be willing to agree as far as any plea negotiations. If that's what you're asking, those would come through the family. We would speak with them, make sure they were in agreement, as well as the sheriff's office. Um, there, the sheriff's office is invested in this case heavily as well, but. Um, Ultimately, we don't decide whether the men and women accept a plea. We would, uh, we prepare as if we're going to trial, and if we go to trial, then we would make sentencing recommendations at that time to the court, and the court would make that determination as to what sentence. Uh, one thing I do want to touch on, the sheriff said, um, is that the the sheriff's office and his agency is still investigating this, and there is potential for other arrests to be made, 
based upon interviews that are being conducted and conducted in uh, subpoenas that are to be returned. That was a long way of saying yes. <laughs> we intend to follow this through to the full extent of the law. Now that we know who, um, explain to the community how difficult it is um, when you're dealing with a victim that doesn't really know why, and, and the answer to why never really comes. Um, especially in this case of mistaken identity, as we've spoken about, it's difficult to put a finger on how um, how scary that is for a community as a whole. Um, it could have happened to anybody. So, you know, I, and, and Ms. Arano is here, and I think it, at some point, if you know, with whatever level she feels comfortable, I think she's the most capable of telling her story. Um, I don't think I can adequately even imagine the pain and suffering and the fear that, that this family has, has faced in America. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm not going to at the end of the day. But I will tell you from a community standpoint, th this with the randomness of this, the, the I, I think you know for many citizens that's that's your worst fear that through no fault of your own um, you become the victim of something it's, it's almost unimaginable you know I was, I, I was saying someone earlier, I've been doing this 28 years if I'm being if I'm being honest in these types of events to have somebody is completely innocent of involvement of this is is not a common occurrence it's not a common occurrence you know a lot of times we make lifestyle choices this is not one of them this is not one of them. And I think that's what particularly hits for this community and, and for the office as well, is that in many ways, Ms. Arano and her family represent every one of us, every one of us, that we could be going to church, leaving going to church, and have your life inexorably altered by an act of violence for no discernible reason that would ever make sense to you. Uh, with that, if there are any other questions?